Welcome to the weekly Wednesday Savage out on air. I'm your host, Jared Savage Daddy Gunning, and tonight's topic campaign design. And here to discuss it with us, Chris the Savage Mommy Fox. Hello. Some call him Jib. Salut. W the Savage Cheerleader. Hola. Uh, Dave the Savage Raymond Scott, not joining us tonight uh, in the process of a move. So, so He's missing an action. <laughs> Tonight's topic, uh, the reason we're, we're having this discussion is because you see a lot of uh, discussion on the forums, boards, about Savage Worlds being incredible for one-shots. It's awesome for one-shots. But a lot of doubt as to whether or not it can, uh, whether or not you can run a long-running, sustained campaign in it. And we're going to talk tonight about not only tools and resources... Um, methods, ideas, how you go about it. And I will tell you from personal experience, and like I, uh, we're not going to turn this into it, let me tell you about my camp. Um, I just finished a month ago running an 18-month-long gritty, gritty zombie campaign in Savage Worlds. So, yes, it can be done. So, let's approach campaign design. Can I go first? <laughs> okay. Um... First things first, do not plan the ending when you start your campaign. Because you don't know. You flat do not know. Um, create the world in which your campaign takes place. You only need to detail things that you need right now. People that you need now. Anybody that you don't need immediately but you know what you think may come up later, just make a note about them, that they exist, and kind of maybe, you know, one sentence about what they're about, and you're done. That's all you need. Um, same goes for places that you don't need yet. Um, just a note that it exists, and maybe like one sentence or two about, you know, what it's about, and you're done. Now... Your campaign is going to start. You need a little more information about that. You need more more detail. You need more people. You need more places. You need more things in it. The critical element, though, is what's going on. What's going on is based on the people that are involved. And you have to think beyond this game session. You have to think. They have plans that go that go beyond this game session. So, for example, in my uh, at the beginning of my Deadlands campaign that has now been running for three years, um, there was a, a bad guy and there was a place and the bad guy wanted a thing, and that was the basis for the campaign. And then the player character showed up and works and so he decided he wanted a different thing. and But he just annoyed the hell out of them for, for months and months and months. And, but would never show his face. They could never, you know, find him. They could never pin him down. Become to do things. And that was the basis of the campaign. That's really all it took. To build a campaign that ended up running for three years. Okay. Um, I, me personally, I like to create a timeline uh, for the world. Uh, once again, like Jim said, not nailing down anything too specific, uh, but to use a zombie apocalypse as a uh, as an example. I know what caused the outbreak, when it happened, what happened as a result of the outbreak. Its effect on the world. However, I'm dropping the characters in the timeline three months after that's happened. Or if I want a different style of game, I'm putting them ground zero, front and center at the beginning of that timeline. So I think it depends on a little bit on what genre you're trying to run in. And I think you need to create a, a decent timeline of events. Uh, past, present, and future. 
and then find places to put those characters uh, in the story when it begins on that timeline. Now, I agree 100% with Jib that there is no point in deciding what the outcome is. Um, I'm a big believer, too, in the... It's not the sandbox, because that's a bullshit, uh, dirty, hippie term that just doesn't exist. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know Scott said it as well. It's a theme park. Yeah. Uh, I've got a roll to world over here. Hey, there's kitty rides over there. Um, and you just create your world and your campaign world as Disneyland, as a theme park, with uh, each separate area or adventure maybe representing a different villain that's somehow related to the plot, maybe not related to the plot. But to me, it's uh, it's all about creating the initial timeline. Is my first step in creating a, uh, a long-running campaign. How about you, Scott? Um, yeah, I guess it... Um I guess it really depends, right? If you're going from scratch of world creation, then you need to do a world Bible. Um, and if you're going to do that, the best reference you can have for a world Bible is actually Cobalt Press, the guide to world building. There's a section in there that just tells you what you need in a world Bible and how to actually write it to where it makes sense and it doesn't eat up people's time. You can hand out a one-page... Um, it's not an elevator pitch. But write that in there that they're going to need to know. Um, but yeah, as far as an adventure so, or a campaign, um, I tend to do the, I, well, I, I, I adhere to the Lazy DM. It's a book you can get from Sly Flourish. Um, it's really simple. It's essentially just using cards to build on that first adventure. And we'll do the group creation, right, group template with the characters. And that lets me know what they want by listening to them discuss and debate. And we'll talk about what the world wants and um you know, kind of what's going to be in the game. So I'm running the Eberron game, and that's pretty much what I did. I said, look, here's my restrictions on the, on Eberron. Here's all the guidelines of Eberron. Here's all the races you can play. However, you're all going to be from Siri. That's the only thing I'm going to say, that every single one of you comes from the nation of Siri. And then we went forward from there, and they really got into it and discussed it. And so when you when I build a campaign, I'll just start with an, um, my main antagonist, my main protagonist, you know, for the party helpers, and then give them a couple of sub-levels, and then really you just do an adventure seed, and then I let the campaign organically develop. Um, I just kind of just like to see what the players really want to do, because that's what they're going to do. They're going to let you know what they find interesting and what they don't find interesting. True. Uh, Chris? Well, I'd add, mostly, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I go, I've gone the plot point route. I like the plot points. I like having that structure that then I can add my own adventures in. Uh, what I've done with The Flood, uh, this is my second time I'm running for a completely different party, uh, is, and I've been running it for quite some time, is, is I'm using it, uh, but I'm also peppering in uh, adventures of my own creation and then trying to get some adventures uh, that are around the player's backstory. Uh, you know, I had them all come up. We, we talked about them. They gave me some backstory. And so I've been trying to, you know, pepper those things in to it as well. Um, you know, so I've run that. I ran Evernight for a group from beginning to end. Uh, I, I, I'm running War of the Dead. I've been running it for over two years now, probably almost three years with the same group. Uh, we're just, we, you know, we only play a couple times a month. So it's taken us a while, but it's ongoing. They're having a great time. You know, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a proponent. I like the plot points. Oh, yeah. not a book totally to take agree. out a great one. Not, not a book to take out a great one that I'm aware of. No, not um, really. I, I also think probably one of the most overlooked things when it comes to is knowing who the main villains are. Not necessarily villains, but who the main, main NPCs, people. NPCs yeah. are. And it's them based right. on the situation yeah. and the world. Uh, if you're doing a zombie campaign, that's very simple. Uh, shelter, security, food. Mm -hmm. uh, about getting those things a very different way. <laughs> so I think um, if you have a good solid understanding of what your world is about and what's going on in it at a meta level and then work down to how does this affect maybe each individual region in your game? How does it affect the the main uh, 
uh, the main bad guy, if you have a main bad guy, maybe it's just a bunch of different factions yeah. of NPCs, and maybe they're also in the background warring against each other. So, but I um, think the, the problem is not understanding motivations based on the world and the circumstances. Good. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I wanted to add, <clears throat> when you're when one of your players comes up and says, I, I want to play this race, blah, 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 whatever, doesn't matter what it is, and you have no, you haven't, haven't thought about it, because that's going to happen, I promise, let them do it. Absolutely. Let them write, come up with what they are. Oh, right. you want to play a dwarf? Cool. Tell me all about dwarves in this world. Right, and that's the thing, because, um, right? That's perfect because when you come time for interludes, that's the shit you can draw on and be like, hey, you know, why don't you, you know, your people have some strange customs when it comes to burial of the dead. We've noticed that from the last fight. What exactly was going on there? And then you can just roll that fuck. Or, so I have poker diets. I don't draw a card. Um, but yeah, you can say like, you know, and then you can blend that into like, so your people are really morose. Is it, this, this must stem from some kind of uh, a horrific event that occurred in your people's history. What yeah. is that like? You know, and yeah, they just build that race. It's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, same vein then too. If you if you believe in the if you're a proponent of the group template, the idea of all characters are together and character creation is its own session of play, which I highly recommend and highly back. Uh, with the GM sitting there and trying to just sort of reinforce, hey, we're building an ensemble cast here. Yeah. How about we don't have a lot of skill crossover? Exactly. Uh, hey, uh, hey, guess what? Not everybody in the party needs notice. And, yeah. and I would say don't be don't be scared to say not necessarily no, but let's work on this together because you know I yeah. was trying to I was trying to run Deadlands Noir the 1950s, and I set up in the character creation for them to start this campaign. I said, this is the this is what's going on. You all have to have a reason to be working for this detective agency. It's a detective uh -huh. agency. You know, my in my mind, I'm thinking they're they're going to be white hats. That's uh -huh. what I and that's what I like in my in in my campaigns. I don't like. I'm not much for evil. I'm not much for that. And I had one guy who decided he, he, I'm an assassin. Oh God damn. <laughs> and I didn't and I didn't say no. And it 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 just. I had a hard time dealing with his character. And, and, See, listen, um, the is to say, well, let's work with the character. In my opinion, there's nothing wrong with GM going, no. And here's why. They, ultimately, if the this, you know, we we've talked a lot about recently about you know player agency and what GM this is a point. Of God. Yeah. Yes. No, you will not play that character in this game. Yep. No. Right. Okay. What I, now, you know, so you have a guy, an assassin. Okay, cool. So why is it that your assassin is working with these guys? Right. So you tell me, why is your assassin working with these guys? And it can it doesn't have to be exotic. Um, I had a, years ago, I had a player who was playing um, a, a very evil character, thoroughgoing evil, a string of dead bodies in every town she'd been in. Okay. <laughs> And when I asked her, why, so why is your is this character with the party? She said, cover. Yeah. They are her cover. That's sufficient. So, yeah. so she yeah. set out to make friends of them and to make them trust her and believe in her. When the authorities came calling, and they did, it was the paladin in the group that jumped up to defend her first. Nice. Right. Very well, nice. and, and here's the thing. Before you say no, uh, back up and rewind a little bit. As a GM, you should be surveying the players, going, "Hey, this is the kind of game that I want to run for a long." Yeah, These make sure the they want to do it. Yeah. Now, if this is something you guys don't want to do, let's talk about adjusting that. Yep. But if you're all on board with playing, and this is one of the first discussions I had when doing the dead end thing was, "Listen, this is not Bruce Willis zombies. We're not running that kind of game." <laughs> this is Night of the Living Dead. Old old school Romero, gritty, gritty, gritty. So uh -huh. you, uh, we, I want everybody to take on the roles of ordinary people and see how you guys survive in, a, in an apocalypse. 
So the first thing that you had to tell was, is everybody on board with that? It sounds like really cool. I said, okay, well, you're going to be exploring humanity. Can you trust people? Kosis is going to be part of this game. All these things, this is what we're going for. And then the first person would go, yeah, I'm a Green Beret. No, you're not. No, you're not. About that. <laughs> you, you obviously missed the memo. What are you going for? So I think before you can say no, you have to have a clear understanding of what the purpose and theme and everything else is. Yeah. Along the same lines of group character creation in an ensemble cast. And, hey, it's okay to have a pacifist support character. It's okay to have a gun nut, just combat monkey. Fine. But it's the cast, the cast of characters working well together. It's the Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Princess Leia. Right. Combination. Yeah. Uh, they're all good at individual tasks, and they all complement each other as a group. Yep. Now, I think that you can apply that same... Uh, that same process to world building as well. Yeah. So if you want to build a cooperative world with the players, you can say, hey, we're a fantasy game. Uh, what does magic look like in this game? And you can just sort of pull people around the table. Yeah. So if it, there is a product out there, and it's a great product. There's several, but the one that's the best is uh, Microscope. It's very cheap. If you don't have it, go get it. Um, that is pretty much how I start every fantasy game now is that the first session is you creating a you creating the universe that you your character is going to be in. you pick a, a big idea right like so all right we are playing the children of refugees who settled the valley after the war and then you have a starting point would be when they got there and then the end point of your timeline is when your character is ready to adventure right? and these time hacks within that and what I'll do is we'll go down, so you have like a, a major, like a big, big event overriding like the Dark One came. And then some, and then you can drill down and then say, okay, well, when the Dark One came, underneath that umbrella there was the Battle of the Battle of the right, is a big event that happened. And you declare each one of these, was that a light event or a dark event? You know, was there a boon or a, a bane to what happened? And then you do a scene. Um, I'll take a look around and say, okay, well, we pre-game this and said, here are the races we agree on, and here are the classes that we've agreed on. Or if it's Savage World, you know, here are the races that we've all said are, are, are kosher. So at the Battle of the Twins, why were the elves there? Right? You can ask those leading questions. The player has every right to be like, no, 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 they were there, but here's why everyone thought they weren't there. Or that's just a misconception. So you continue to build this way, and you, everyone can go around the table, you know, two, three times, depending on group size. And when you get done, you're going to have this really cool fucking... Uh, setting, a microscope vision of, of this world, and then as you play, you can be like, oh yeah, who's playing the healer? Okay, well, get ready, because during the game, you're going to be answering theological questions for the group and setting theological truths for the world. And the same thing, all of that. A microscope is badass. It's, it's well worth the money. Those guys deserve every penny. Yeah, and I, I think it's a, a great way to go, considering if, you, if you're going to be telling cooperative storytelling, yes. why not do cooperative world building? Why not do <laughs> cooperative character generation? Yes, and do you know why it works the best? And I'm going to say this again and make a lot of fucking enemies off the internet. Because every motherfucker makes Lord of the fucking Rings. Every fucking time, every fucking fantasy game is the same stupid shit. Humans, elves, dwarves, small folk, uh, great evil. We got some wizards and some rangers. And it's totally not Lord of the Rings, but you know. Right. Yeah, stop. <laughs> that shit is boring. Lord of the Rings is fucking boring. Middle Earth is boring. Gandalf casts all of the wizard. He's unimpressive. But yeah, if you do the if you do cooperative, man, your world will never turn out Lord of the Rings. I guarantee you'll never see a Lord of the Rings plain vanilla fantasy world. Right. Sounds right. Uh, but they're the, the dwarves are morose because dwarves are cannibals. Right, yeah, yeah. Weird shit will come up the table. And when you tell someone, look, whatever comes out of your mouth is gospel truth and no one can change it. Like, no one can, con can countermand or contradict what you state when it's your turn. Right. And, yeah, man, people go all over the so, place with it. Yeah, interesting twist if, like, you know, the idea of dwarves was, oh, our, our theology, our world creation origin believes that, that we grew as maggots out of a, the body of a giant uh, that represents the earth, then that's how we decay and everything else. We eat the dead. We all participate in eating part of the dead flesh and then burying them in the ground. Yep, see, that's, that's our, badass. Those are our funerary rituals. Exactly. 
Yeah, and man. none of us, none of us ever speak with a Scottish accent. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, that's not a lot. Yeah, I give them Scottish accents then. Yeah. Feel a little respectful for their um, badass. So we'll go ahead and get to that. Um, I did mention at the start of the show, but we do have the Q&A running uh, in Google Hangouts. So if, you want, if you're watching and you want to ask a question uh, or participate, feel free. I'm going to go ahead and get this one from Steven Dragonspawn. And he asked, do you guys believe that giving players set limits when creating NPCs allows them more ideas or that giving carte blanche gets more creative juices flowing? I going. think the PCs are making an NPC as well. But we can talk about that later. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends. The whole thing about giving them, you know, carte blanche... I don't know if it, I think you want to focus it a little, little bit. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you want to throw the entire entire thing out out to them, if you know what I mean. You want to, you want to focus it a little bit. Yeah, you got to be willing to make some concessions, right? So again, like since this is the one I'm doing is Eberron, there are elves, but there are three different, well, four different types of elves in Eberron. I didn't tell them that. I told them you can play an elf, and your elf is going to be a Siri elf, and you're a civilized elf, and the other elves you look down upon because one is of the giants and hung out behind on the dark continent. So, no, those three you can't play. Right. I mean, you can still well, be an elf. I, I, I <sighs> kind of question comes from lack of GM and player trust. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, why do I need to set limits going ahead, uh, I mean, going into it? Or declare that uh, you have narrative authority and anything you say cannot be, eh, yeah. I don't know. I think it's, I, I, once again, to me, okay. this kind of comes down to what we what we were talking about before, is when you sit down, if the GM has a very simple idea of the theme of the campaign, he should by all means have talking points. Yep. And this is the game I am running. Yep. These right. that theme and... No. Now, if it's the, hey, what do you guys want? I don't know. Maybe some fan- <laughs> that's a completely different story. Absolutely. And yeah. when, when that's the case, you don't need to worry about carte blanche or limits uh, in character creation. It just sort of... Just get ready for five fucking drizzits. <laughs> so what are you going to say, Jim? Two things. Um, one is... Okay, the the phrase is collaborative storytelling. Yeah. That starts when you're cl- Yeah. Um so, you know, you vo- the it, the conversation typically starts with, "Okay, guys, here's the game I have in mind. Here's what I'm th- Um so does that Oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, cool. Now, <laughs> let's make characters. Oh, I want to make a green beret. No, we already <laughs> established that 10 minutes ago. Stop that. Smack. Uh, so that's his. Um, we had a guy who emailed into us with to us with a really really great way of of working with this, and uh, Stu started doing it, and I've been doing it, and it works, guys. Here is the situation as it begins. Make somebody who would get involved in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a very right. clever way of yes. doing shit. It's a very clever way of make someone who would get involved in that. Because that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Especially with Savage Rules, right? Since, I mean, Savage Rules does that hot, like, you know, the fucking airship is plummeting, the wind is rushing at you, the Luftwaffe is screaming by you. Yeah. Why are you on board this fucking Zeppelin that's plummeting towards the Earth? Yeah, I mean, right. it's, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's because, because it, it, gets, it, it gets everybody on the same page at the uh oh. <laughs> I don't know. He's freezing out first. Which is funny to me because we're probably in the same lag time he's in. Like, it's buffering and throwing it back out. Yeah. Uh, Jim, Jim is frozen a little bit. He's got some lag going on. But, I mean, yeah, that, that is, that's part of. I mean, we've, we've had these discussions before. That's, that's cooperative, you know, group template characterization stuff. And, yeah, you can build the world first and drop the characters in it as far as your campaign. Mm-hmm. Or you can get the characters together, build the world, build the world, build the characters, and start the campaign. I agree, but as far as design goes, 
uh, we discussed about having a timeline, having a, a fairly fleshed out world, at least for your first session. Long running, sustained campaign. Any drop out? No, he. Well, what are you doing? A long running? Yeah, you can hooks. Yeah. Or MacGuffins, or the, the the super antagonists, you know, yeah, right. A murder mystery. There's a whole hangout on running investigation. There is. We talked about that end and working backwards. Yep. But I, when you're when you're when you have your timeline, plot hook, and he's going around country to country, collecting nuclear missile launch codes. That's a plot hook. Yeah. There. This is blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. they're all under control of alien overlords hiding on hiding in, in uh, flying saucers on the dark side of the moon, in my opinion. And we're not talking about solving this problem. We're just talking about a whole bunch of, hey, this is going on, this is going on, this is going on, and this is how it ties into the entire plot. It's when I get 16 marks... Along this plot line, that's when this shit this shit happens. Sure. And, and you've got what your players do. You've got to have things oh, go yeah. on in. And it's just their static little bubble. Right. You don't feel like anything bubble that they're in. So you really to have those gone. I've, 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 I've tried to keep going up to Shanfan in the flood, and I keep having them run into the same. A few See, of the same folks. Right there is where my favorite tool for campaign management comes in. And that is Microsoft OneNote. Yep. Because Microsoft OneNote allows you to organize information and bring all kinds of stuff together um, into one place, into one living, breathing, moving document thing with just some sketched in notes about the rest of what's going on and you can build it and grow it as you go. And um, it, you know, it's just like after after the the game, I sit down, I I type out my notes from the game, and then I know where things are going on. And then I spend like 15 or 20 minutes going through and going, okay, all these other things that are, are percolating in the world, what's going with them too? So ah, uh, okay, and now I'm done. Yep, and you can hyperlink okay. shit in between. Shit, you can drop media into it. And you oh yeah. Them, but I mean, it is. If you're not using OneNote and you're a fucking game master, you are you are doing it wrong. Yeah, and I do not use it. I do not use it yeah, to man. anywhere near its full oh. <laughs> uh, Let's talk about the ticking time. Uh, the okay, ticking yeah. Clock. For a second, and now I do this in, in OneNote. So, Mesosopheles Jones Jones is going around collecting nuclear launch codes mm -hmm. around the country. By July 3rd, he will have all the nuclear launch codes. On July 4th, he's going to send all of our missiles to, to, to Washington. Somewhere. The oh, White. okay. The oh, White he's, 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 he's not an Obama fan then. So, uh, he works for Google. So, <laughs> oh. so that's his plan. So the player characters are going to maybe bump into him in one of these cities. Venturing mm -hmm. from May 1st, 4th. Boom. Boom. Yeah, sure. The player characters are the only ones who can stop it. Okay, so in one note, practical step by step, how do you set up that campaign and that plot? Give me a few <laughs> screen share. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you have it. I'm not going to type anything out, but I will show you how I divide shit up. I think it's the same way you divide I, shit I up. hear a lot of people talk. It has all those features, but how, how do you actually use it? it? How do you Go. execute that? Go, Scott. Yeah, I'm I trying. Will uh, yes, let's see. So I'm just going to... Uh, okay, so you see the tabs across, right? Not yet. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, right, so where the mouthy is, there's the title of your notebook, right? So when you first get the notebook, you get to pick a title and get to pick a color. Uh, make sure you're top of the title because you're not going to change it, not ever, not know how. Um, and, and then across the tab, across the top is where I do my tabs, right? So you can see what they say, hopefully. Uh, Story, right now it's on my... character, NPC. Mm -hmm. places, places, things, things events, events. <laughs> notes, <laughs> rules, props, the world bible. 
um, which I just keep on there no matter what I'm doing. This is from my Eberron campaign, by the way. Adventure okay. Creation Lazy GM. One I'm on now is my resources. So these are all the books, PDFs that I own that I've incorporated here as my GM's reference book. Right? Nice. So you can do things like um, here's a list of the character creation. Here's, so here's like the, MP, the major GM siege that the characters have met so far, right? And it tells you their health status, status the name, their, any alias they're known by, their affiliation with the group, and any notes. Um, and so, that, so that's just a, for, for those who are not going to be able to see this, that's just a simple spreadsheet sheet under NPCs. Yep. Um, and that's all it is. So, like, the professor, the professor is the one, is their major ally. She's their, she's their, their provocateur, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. the good provocateur. And the bottom one is um, an Emerald Claw captain. They just met. They killed him in a healing pool, and they are not aware of that. They knew it was a healing pool, but they didn't understand the repercussions of putting him into this pool to get rid of the body. So he's going to come back because he's also heroes never die. Right. You can do the same shit for places, right, locations. It tells you what type of place it is, what's the name of it, where it's located, description uh, of based on what the characters saw or know of. And you also have a vertical page uh, menu, right? Right? So I can add... Uh, the name of the name of a specific uh, event tavern, a tavern. Yeah, Ta- yeah a tavern, and everybody who's in it. In it. An, an yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and on the summary page that you've got, you've got here, mm-hmm. you can you can link that to the actual page. Yes, like if I wanted. To it. Yeah, like, yeah. Like if I so I have a picture of Korenberg University, right? Because I'm a super nerd, and I could put that as a sub page underneath locations, like the Eberron map sort of is. And then I could hyperlink. When you click on Kornberg University, it would it would automatically pull up the the picture of Kornberg University. And so I hook my laptop. Well, I don't hook it. I use uh, AirPlay on my lap, my TV, and that's how my characters interact with the maps of the world. I do I, everything is digital. The sound is digital. The maps are digital, and it's this huge view viewpoint that they can see instead of trying to you know put something on the table. And so then I can just start popping up pictures of okay, well here's what Sharn looks like when you're flying into it on a elemental airship. Um, yeah, so events, I don't have any of the events listed, unfortunately. Um, so for you can create a spreadsheet here with a timeline under yes, events. Under, under events, yeah. Uh, what I, yeah to, to answer your, your direct, direct question, I would go right here, and I would have summary page, and I would have a view that was, and it was a list of dates. And the events that are, that are going to happen on those dates, unless the player characters do something about it. Exactly. Right? So like one May, no, no. May first code is stolen. Yeah, May first, first first code stolen. And what city he's in? And you Cleveland. Could put, you could put yeah, and you could put what city he's gonna yep. be in on certain I can't spell dates. Cleveland. Fuck you. And then if, if the Columbus. players if the players aren't at that city on that day, he gets. He gets. Uh, he, so you he's can kind of you can kind of play that out with every city that he's gonna be in on what yeah. day to kind of say okay, so on May sixth he's gonna be in Tampa, Portland. Florida. Yeah. Yep. If the characters don't catch him there, you know, whatever, you know, and so you can kind of play that way to know where he's going to be versus right. where the characters are. And now, then, then you can start your game. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Jared. Go ahead. One thing you would add to the game, too, is, okay, in your notes section for the game, you would just put session one, session one, mm-hmm. session two, session yeah. three. Yeah. On session one, you can drop four characters in Columbus, Ohio on May 1st. Yeah. We started, and this, here's a little summary. They yeah. did not run into Mephistopheles Jones. Or they did run into Mephistopheles Jones. Yeah. Yeah, so you say, like, met M- MJ. Yep. Right. And then you can even do this, right? So this is the thing. You just double-click it, you insert and wherever you're keeping MJ, right. you can just put a hyperlink to that. So I'll show you what I'm talking about with here. I'll go to the store thing. So, uh, off to the side, the, 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 the little adventure they're on is a tale of turning tides. So, right. underneath this, I've got their first pieces of evidence they're going to find, right? So, I have only filled out the one. Then I have a list of foes. So, the first chapter in the turning tides is dark rain. And it tells you, okay, here's what happens. They're going to be standing underneath this thing, waiting to meet someone. The person they're meeting isn't coming, but a fucking body is coming down at, uh, from a 30-foot drop on top of the party. And then that will begin the murder investigation. And then I have a, a few different paths that they can take on. And so the first path is they're going to go out, like, someone may go after the two guys who just dumped the body. So I have these little stat cards from 
Woolcocks, uh, or Woodcock, sorry, well, Woodcocks, little uh, Savage World shit. So I, have, I just dump a full MP in here, and I have access to yeah. a little adventure card. Oh my god, those are so cool. They are so. It's a uh, Zadamar shit. Uh, Richard Woodcock. I'll do like. Here's the body. If you make a heal, right, it's badly beaten to death. On a race, you know he's been interrogated. And I just have evidence for an investigation that I want. This is probably the most I've had to prep for a game because it's a murder mystery. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's, um, they're being watched by a Dark Lantern. If you guys know what Eberron is, it's basically a CIA operative that works for the Crown and a codenamed Talisman. And he's observing this because the guy who fell from the balcony is his source that he's been running. And so he's kind of curious as to what the hell the source is meeting these strangers. And it just sort of goes on from there, right? And then... Yeah, you got to go to the warehouse. Here's the wild card they're going to have to fight. And then there's the rogues. And, there's and the, and the nice thing about this is you have a generalized story tab in your notebook mm-hmm. horizontally. Yep. And then you have a vertical page tab underneath that off to the right menu where you can go yep. story, session one, session two, mm-hmm. sub, seven, yeah. sub adventures. Yep, absolutely. And, and you know, it, go ahead. It's, it's just like this. Um, it's like open, mind. It's a nice mind mapping. It's type. like a. It's kind of like a mind mapping thing that you can link back and forth to. Yep. Um, I record all of my game sessions, and those are all on my laptop. So you know, I have links that if you click the link, it brings up the recording. Is it? Um, yeah. you know, in my notes and uh, and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's just. And if you want to take the time, you can create a separate notebook for just. Random pre-generated NPCs, right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, dude. Especially with something like um, the cast of cards, right? Right. Even though it's it's kind of pain in the ass, you can do it that way, or like or Richard's web page where you just generate shit. Right. You know, yeah, you could just copy paste all that shit and just dump them in there and there and be like, huh. and you can. So like, let me. So up here in the search function, it's pretty powerful actually. So I know there's a Dolgaunt hidden away in this in this story, right? Right. Uh-huh. So I just start typing, and then, oh, look, the Dolgaunt, and he's the thing in the box, and it pulls it right up when you highlight it. Nice. Yeah, so you can just go right into that shit. Yeah, as a, as a long-term campaign management, management tool, one notebook for the current campaign you're running, mm-hmm. but then you could have a separate notebook that is just NPCs or, or whatever, and you could interlink between your notebooks. Yeah, yeah sure. Hyperlink them. Sure. Yep. Like I just did um, an audio recording. You yeah, can drop you can do an audio recording like right in there. Yeah, like an in, like an intro text, right? Like if you have uh, like pulp like pulp noir this detective noir shit you want to get across to the peep to the party when it first starts. Right. You just read this really cool like the, she had gems from my You have a battle sound that you really like that you want to yeah. be played during the session. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um and okay. I'm gonna add on I'm gonna add something onto this. Okay. All of the your notebooks are stored both on your physical device and in the cloud. Oh yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I have my I can I don't have to have my laptop. I do all the work on my laptop, but I don't have to have it there. All I have to do is have my iPad. Yeah, yep. there's times when I'll be out and about doing something and just waiting for other people. And I'll just make notes. Yeah, I'll pull my phone out and just like okay, let me see if there's anything else I can add to this. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, it's it is a super super good tool. Yeah, it really um, is. And it has so, it has so much power and so much capability to do things. And I this is I have to I have to admit something here. The Windows version is better than the Mac version. Yeah, it's got a little more little more a, a bit more to it. It's a Microsoft product. I would yeah. certainly hope. So. <laughs> They're not however, not supporting it. Yeah. However, at this point on the Mac, it's free. Yes. Yep. Right. Yes. Everything, all of this stuff that you've seen here is free. And I believe, I believe it's also f- a free app for most Android. I believe that I, is true. Well. Yeah. Yep. I, I, yeah, I, I've heard people before talk about OneNote when it comes to game prep and stuff, but nobody actually. No, here's the way I set up a notebook. Yeah. Here's the tabs I have, and here's how I do it. And I think that's really. Probably more than anything else is a campaign management tool. <laughs> Go grab one. Yeah, dude, this thing is <laughs> badass. 
you just keep everything, you know, you're fucking genius. Like, I have all my setting rules in yep. one spot, you know, off of the side here. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, and it's, sometimes it's little things that I don't remember because I don't use a GM screen. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, okay, well, here's some of the shit I need, and here's the actual setting rules. But if you're searching somewhere else, you're just busy, all I got to do is be like, you know, God damn it! How does right. leg work start work? You know, right? They go, oh, now, look, it's in detective work. There it is for me. You could also do this. Well, not this, but you could <laughs> also consider Roll Twenty a campaign management tool. Yeah, I use that. Too. All the people involved in your cam- involved in your campaign have permission to that site. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a forum that you can actually participate in. Mm-hmm. Very few people use it. Um, but once you're inside Roll20, if you want to dedicate some time to create handouts and things like that, you can get some of the OneNote functionality mm-hmm. as a handout for, oh, here's how object compass works. Yeah. Here's how hazards works. But you just have to go in there and create individual handouts. Uh, yeah, OneNote, much smoother. Much, much smoother with it. By all... but. No, no contest. But you can get some limited functionality uh, in Roll20 if you're already using Roll20. Mm-hmm. Uh, the portal? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, Obsidian Portal. Yeah, for, for free <laughs> yeah. Even if you're not doing a community just for your campaign, yeah. and let that be your centralized hub of communication. Because On that, but I can't... Thing, um, the players have really gotten into using um, Obsidian Portal site for it and put in some the basic stuff and the players have just gone. plus page for my 50 fathoms campaign offered everyone uh, everyone at Benny for giving a, a ship's log nobody will do it boo boo uh, this is what I would do I would go as a GM and post clues to the adventure <laughs> yeah right I mean I see where you're going with that. Hey, yeah. What? Yeah, I posted the clues. So. What? Hold. Just curious to start leaving clues and things that actually come up in the game. But, so, I, I think we've pretty much exhausted. Is, is there anything you guys think we've left out of this discussion? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, mean, I, I, I think the broad strokes are basically this is a GM. Um... Build the skeleton, build the framework. Know when things are going to happen, what impact, what motivations are. Yeah. But, but that's the problem. No. Oh, that's what I wanted to add. For, for, for Chris talking about, like, he has to re-steer people, and, like, when you have your timeline, make, make sure that when they're doing stuff, like, Chris, especially for Deadlands, because you can, like, do, like, the faux tombstones and shit. Um, the newsletter, and you can have right. news stories happen where you know the bad guys win because the the party just wasn't there to fucking stop them. If, if you know if they're if they're skipping adventures, you don't use it to punish them, but just you can use it to illustrate, hey, you know, you guys knew about this, so right, yeah, it would happen. Right. I I think the adventure design as well, not just campaign design. Um, I the metaphor I would use is you have players sitting around a table, you take a puzzle box, a box with a you know jigsaw puzzle in it, shake it up, it up, and then you take out a black sharpie on the cover and start crossing and coloring things out that they can't see. Lay the, lay the lid down and dump all the pieces. Go. I, I have the idea of, hey, uh, the guy that's robbing a bank while you're sitting across the street having coffee. As a GM, I have no idea how this is going to turn out. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where this is going, but, you know. <laughs> so... Um. Maybe there's a notice roll. Maybe they don't notice that it's going on. Maybe they do. There to present the problem and the solution and railroad them into it. You're there to create, just, just set up some, set up some interesting events. Yeah, man. And sort of fun. Like together to plot and let them work it out. Let let the players figure it out. Yep. Cool. Time let's call pimp it, pimp it, and I will. Whoa. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh. Uh, the Happy Jacks RPG podcast. Uh, they will be streaming live Friday night at eight o'clock or eight thirty Pacific time. So 
fair is over, so get some regular mm-hmm. recording back. Um, I know the week after that, the schedule is probably going to shift to Saturday mornings, so if you're a listener, be aware. Um, also, two Kickstarters. Um, as I mentioned last week, the nice set Metagamers Anonymous are doing a Kickstarter for their uh, convention, which is in October, um, and um, they're a great bunch of folks, and they're not making any money off of this. They're just trying to get enough money to front the costs for things like the venue and whatnot. Um, so you can find them on Kickstarter by putting in TsunamiCon. starts with a T. T-S-U-N-A-M-I. Um, also, uh, my good friend Wes, Mail Games, who does uh, backing tracks and sound effects tracks for games, is doing a Kickstarter. And uh, he does amazing stuff. Uh, just absolutely fantastic sounds and great sound collections. Um, and, uh, you know, great stuff. I highly recommend it. Anything to pip it, pip it? Um, yeah, there's a new podcast I found uh, called Roll Up and Die. Uh, they're OSR dudes, but they're they're in their infancy, like episode nine or so. Really cool guys. They actually have really uh, really good advice, and they get some hot runners on there to come in and have some of these discussions. The latest one is like design how to make it interesting, and they actually have really really cool ideas. Um, and then uh, the, I gotta read. The- I own them. Yes, it's expensive to ship them from California, but oh my Christ, they're really cool. Awesome. I'll see if I can throw a link in the show notes. Chris, pimp it, pimp it. I don't really have a whole lot to pimp. Uh, Rocky Mountain Savage is Denver Comic Con this weekend. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Uh, so that, that's the big thing uh, happening in Denver this weekend. Be there and uh, running some Savage World, some demos, and uh, we've got a, a pretty cool uh, couple of uh, the Rock Mountain Savages are going to run a, a DC versus Marvel game uh, at Comic-Con on Sunday that I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to. Nice. Uh, support the show. Listen to the show. Subscribe to the show. We're on iTunes. Subscribe there. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, there is a Patreon account or Patreon page. You can subscribe to that. But more than anything else, if you enjoy what we're having discussions about and you find it useful and helpful, share it with a friend. Until next time. One thing? Sure. One thing real quick. Um, I will be at uh, GameX 2015 here in sunny Los Angeles, California this coming weekend, Memorial Day. Um, four days of game of amazing gaming from Friday th- to Monday. Uh, come on out and have a good and join us. We'll play some games and have some fun. Awesome. Listeners or viewers, if, if you take Jib up on that offer, um, I uh, challenge you to walk up to him and in your best old man voice, shout at him. So, so what? Until oh, <laughs> next time, this is Jared, this is Jared Savage Daddy Gunning. Savage Jib. Stay safe.